This is an audio recording of Alex Haley's Roots, the Saga of an American Family, read for the purposes of individuals with reading impairments. Acknowledgements. I owe deep gratitude to so many people for their help with Roots that pages would be required simply to list them all. The following are preeminent. George Sims, my lifelong friend from our Henning, Tennessee boyhood, is a master researcher who often traveled with me, sharing both the physical and emotional adventures. His dedicated combing through volumes by the hundreds and other kinds of documents by the thousands, particularly in the U.S. Library of Congress and the U.S. National Archives, supplied much of the historical and cultural material that I have woven around the lives of the people in this book. Murray Fisher had been my editor for years at Playboy magazine when I solicited his clinical expertise to help me structure his book from a seeming impassable maze of researched materials. After we had established Roots' pattern of chapters, next the storyline was developed, which he then shepherded throughout. Finally, in the book's pressurized completion phase, he even drafted some of Root's scenes, and his brilliant editing pen steadily tightened the book's great length. The Africa section of this book exists in its detail only because at a crucial time Mrs. DeWitt Wallace and the editors of the Reader's Digest shared and supported my intense wish to explore if my maternal family's treasured oral history might possibly be documented back into Africa, where all black Americans began. Nor would this book exist in its fullness without the help of those scores of dedicated librarians and archivists in some 57 different repositories of information on three continents. I found that if a librarian or archivist becomes excited with your own fervor of research, they can turn into sleuths to aid your quests. I owe a great debt to Paul R. Reynolds, doyen of literary agents, whose client I have the pleasure to be, and to Doubleday senior editors Lisa Drew and Ken McCormick, all of whom have patiently shared and salved my frustrations across the years of producing Roots. Finally, I acknowledge immense debt to the griots of Africa, where today it is rightly said that when a griot dies, it is as if a library has burned to the ground. The griots symbolize how all human ancestry goes back to some place and some time where there was no writing. Then, the memories in the mouths of ancient elders was the only way that early histories of mankind got passed along, for all of us today to know who we are. Haley's Comet by Michael Eric Dyson From the very beginning, Alex Haley's roots counted as much more than a mere book. It tapped deeply into the black American hunger for an African ancestral home that had been savaged by centuries of slavery and racial dislocation. More than the sum of its historical and literary parts, some of which have been rigorously criticized and debunked, Haley's quest for his roots changed the way black folk thought about themselves and how white America viewed them. No longer were we genealogical nomads with little hope of learning the names and identities of the people from whose loins and culture we sprang. Haley wrote black folk into the book of American heritage and gave us the confidence to believe that we could find our forebears even as he shared his own. Kunta and Kizzy, and Chicken George too, became members of our black American family. That's why no flaw or shortcoming in Haley's tomb could dim the brilliant light he shed on the black soul. Haley's monumental achievement helped convince the nation that the black story is the American story. He also made it clear that black humanity is a shining beacon that miraculously endured slavery's brutal horrors. I was a 17-year-old boarding school student when Haley's comet of a book hit the nation's racial landscape. 
It immediately changed the course of our conversations around school and provided a powerful lens onto a period of history that few of us really understood. Until Haley's book, there was little public grappling with the drama of American slavery. Of course, the epical television miniseries that grew from Haley's text seized us in its thrilling exploration of Chattel slavery's vast and vicious evolution. The book and miniseries also sparked the phenomenon of black self-discovery. For too long, slavery had been an American terror that left the lives of black folk scarred by memories of pain and humiliation. Haley's book brought black folk out of the shadows of shame and ignorance. It also spurred many of us for the first time to speak openly and honestly about the lingering effects of centuries-old oppression. If the black freedom struggle of the 60s had liberated our bodies from the haunting imperatives of white supremacy, Haley's book helped free our minds and spirits from that same force. Roots also prodded white America to reject the racial amnesia that fed its moral immaturity and its racial irresponsibility. As long as there was no book or image that captured slavery's disfiguring reach, the nation could conduct its business as if all racial problems had been solved when it finally bestowed civil rights on its black citizens. But Haley helped us to resist that seductive lie with a tonic splash of colorful truth, that the nation had yet to successfully negotiate its perilous ties to an institution that built white prosperity while crushing black opportunity. Roots was a soulful reminder that unless we grappled with the past, we would be forever saddled with its deadening liabilities. Since it was published during the nation's blithely romantic celebration of its bicentennial, Haley's book provided a touchstone for alternative history. Haley's book helped conscientious citizens to challenge the self-image of America as an unqualified champion of democracy and freedom. The true impact of Haley's book is that it started a conversation about black roots that continues to this day. DNA tests to determine black ancestry are more popular than ever. Scientific advance is part of the explanation, but the cultural impetus for such an agenda of racial discovery lies with Haley's inspiring book. It is also fitting that Roots appeared the same year that Black History Week was officially extended to Black History Month. Haley's crowning achievement came along at just the right time to prompt the investigation of black folks' noble and complex contributions to national culture. Haley's roots sparked curiosity among ordinary citizens by making the intricate relations between race, politics, and culture eminently accessible. Long before demands for history from the bottom up became a rallying cry of progressive historians, Haley's book practiced what it preached. And if he made missteps along the way, he nevertheless put millions of us on the right path to racial and historical knowledge that shaped our reckoning with the color line. Few books can claim such an impressive pedigree of influence. Alex Haley's Roots is unquestionably one of the nation's seminal texts. It affected events far beyond its pages, and was a literary north star that guided us through the long midnight of slavery's haunting presence. Roots is an exercise in the skillful telling of a people's pilgrimage through the quagmire of lost racial links to the solid ground of recovered connections. For that reason alone, it is to be celebrated as a classic of American ambition and black striving. Each generation must make up its own mind about how it will navigate the treacherous waters of our nation's racial sin. And each generation must overcome our social ills through greater knowledge and decisive action. Roots is a stirring reminder that we can achieve these goals only if we look history squarely in the face. 
Chapter 1 Early in the spring of 1750, in the village of Jafur, four days upriver from the coast of the Gambia, West Africa, a man-child was born to Omaro and Binta Kinti. Forcing forth from Binta's strong young body, he was as black as she was, flecked and slippery with Binta's blood, and he was bawling. The two wrinkled midwives, old Nio Boto and the baby's grandmother Yaisa, saw that it was a boy and laughed with joy. According to the forefathers, a boy first born presaged the special blessings of Allah not only upon the parents but also upon the parents' families, and there was the prideful knowledge that the name of Kinti would thus be both distinguished and perpetuated. It was the hour before the first crowing of the cocks, and along with Nio Boto and Grandma Yaisa's chatterings, the first sound the child heard was the muted, rhythmic bomp a bomp a bomp of wooden pestles as the other women of the village pounded couscous grain in their mortars, preparing the traditional breakfast of porridge that was cooked in earthen pots over a fire built among three rocks. The thin blue smoke went curling up pungent and pleasant over the small dusty village of round mud huts as the nasal wailing of Kajali Demba, the village Alimamo, began, calling men to the first of the five daily prayers that had been offered up to Allah for as long as anyone living could remember. Hastening from their beds of bamboo cane and cured hides into their rough cotton tunics, the men of the village filed briskly to the praying place, where the Alimamo led the worship. Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu anna la ilaha illallah. God is great. I bear witness that there is only one God. It was after this, as the men were returning toward their home compounds for breakfast, that Omaro rushed among them, beaming and excited, to tell them of his firstborn son. Congratulating him, all of the men echoed the omens of good fortune. Each man, back in his own hut, accepted a calabash of porridge from his wife. Returning to their kitchens in the rear of the compound, the wives fed next their children, and finally themselves. When they had finished eating, the men took upon their short, bent-handled hoes, whose wooden blades had been sheathed with metal by the village blacksmith, and set off for their day's work of preparing the land for farming of the ground nuts and the couscous and cotton that were the primary men's crops, as rice was that of the women in this hot, lush savanna country of the Gambia. By ancient custom, for the next seven days there was but a single task with which Amoro would seriously occupy himself, the selection of a name for his first-born son. It would have to be a name rich with history and with promise, for the people of his tribe, the Mandinkas, believed that a child would develop seven of the characteristics of whomever or whatever he was named for. On behalf of himself and Binta, during this week of thinking, Omoro visited every household in Jufur and invited each family to the naming ceremony of the newborn child, traditionally on the eighth day of his life. On that day, like his father and his father's father, this new son would become a member of the tribe. When the eighth day arrived, the villagers gathered in the early morning before the hut of Omoro and Binta. On their heads, the women of both families brought calabash containers of ceremonial sour milk and sweet monko cakes of pounded rice and honey. Karamo Silla, the Jaliba of the village, was there with his tang-tang drums, and the Ali Mamo and the Arafang, Brima Sise, who would some day be the child's teacher, and also Omoro's two brothers, Jenna and Salum, who had journeyed from far away to attend the ceremony when the drum talk news of their nephew's birth had reached them.
As Binta proudly held her new infant, a small patch of his first hair was shaved off, as was always done on this day, and all of the women exclaimed at how well formed the baby was. Then they quieted as the Jaliba began to beat his drums. The Ali Mamo said a prayer over the calabashes of sour milk and monko cakes, and as he prayed, each guest touched a calabash brim with his or her right hand, as a gesture of respect for the food. Then the Ali Mamo turned to pray over the infant, entreating Allah to grant him long life, success in bringing credit and pride and many children to his family, to his village, to his tribe, and, finally, the strength and the spirit to deserve and to bring honor to the name he was about to receive. Omaro then walked out before all of the assembled people of the village. Moving to his wife's side, he lifted up the infant and, as all watched, whispered three times into his son's ear the name he had chosen for him. It was the first time the name had ever been spoken as this child's name, for Omaro's people felt that each human being should be the first to know who he was. The Tan Tang drum resounded again, and now Omaro whispered the name into the ear of Binta, and Binta smiled with pride and pleasure. Then Omoro whispered the name to the Arafang, who stood before the villagers. The first child of Omoro in Binta Kinti is named Kunta, cried Brima Sise. As everyone knew, it was the middle name of the child's late grandfather, Kairaba Kunta Kinti, who had come from his native Mauritania into the Gambia, where he had saved the people of Jafur from a famine, married Grandma Yaisa, and then served Jafur honorably till his death as the village's holy man. One by one, the Arafang recited the names of the Mauritanian forefathers of whom the baby's grandfather, old Kairaba Kinti, had often told. The names, which were great and many, went back more than two hundred reigns. Then the Jaliba pounded on his tantang, and all of the people exclaimed their admiration and respect at such a distinguished lineage. Out under the moon and the stars, alone with his son that eighth night, Omoro completed the naming ritual. Carrying little Kunta in his strong arms, he walked to the edge of the village, lifted his baby up with his face to the heavens, and said softly, Fend Kailing Dorang La Warata Kaitati. Behold, the only thing greater than yourself.